All right, welcome everybody. I'm glad you guys are here. So let's let's go ahead as we'll just give everybody another minute to, to come on in and we'll pray. I always try to I know, I realize now that the class starts at five after instead of ten. But that's okay. All right, so let's pray. Father, thank you so much for for allowing us to do this and bringing everybody here. Father, please help us to understand your word. Father, that all of your word is important, not just part of it. Father, we just commit it to you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so today, you guys, we're going to be going into some stuff today that you guys are going to say to yourself, boy, I'm glad I read the Old Testament. Because the thing is, is that we're going to talk about stuff today that you've probably heard of and understood or known before, but never, maybe never really kind of got, the, got the, how the Old Testament and New Testament fits together. And this is the whole reason why I wanted to do this class, is when that day about eight months ago when Jeff had a sermon and said, look, a lot of people now are trying to say we need to get rid of the Old Testament and not read it. And I about had a heart attack and said, well, that's kind of dumb. And you're going to see why today it's important to have that, that what we have in Christ is a continuance of what they did back in the Old Testament. You're going to see where a lot of stuff came in. So, and again, it's hard to read the Old Testament because even Nikita was just saying, well, well, how do we do it? Because it's so vast. It's huge. But I'm going to help give you guys some stuff today to help you guys to understand. So, what did we talk about last week? Well, we talked about last week about the law. The law was given because of two reasons. First, and this is important to understand, because if you understand both of these reasons, then you'll understand what the law was doing, what God did by the law. And so when you read the stuff and it looks a little strange to you, you're going to say, oh, well, that makes sense. So first reason was because they were slaves and God took them completely out of that place and put them in a new place. They had no idea how to take care of themselves. They did no idea how to, to uh, manage themselves, have government, whatever. God established all that in the law. Well, the second thing he did was because the people were so evil all around them, God said, I am going to make things, I want to set things in place to make you guys different from them. And that's kind of important because when we deal with the dietary laws and stuff like that, as we talked about last week, the dietary laws were very specific to that region. It doesn't work everywhere. Because, I mean, like I said, I came over and I almost ran into a couple camels on the way. Can't eat camels, but you know what? It's, but that would be the thing. You know, particular grasshoppers or particular fish, or camels, or whatever. That was very specific to that reason, region. So. Also, one of the things I really did stress last week was how God took care of the rich and the poor. And the reason why I thought about that this week, how do I, you know, I know I kind of really pushed that issue last week. And one of the reasons, there's actually two reasons why I did that. Well, the first reason is in the early church, there was the big push to say, if you want to be holy, you've got to be poor. God says, give everything up. You know, God didn't tell you to give everything up. They said, give everything up, become a monk in the desert. And when we go through the Christian history part of the, down the road, we're going gonna, gonna, to find out that the people would do that. But the other problem is, is the opposite. We have the health and wealth gospel now that says, brother, if you just give, God will give you back. As if everybody's going to become millionaires. And let me tell you, I never met anybody who, who gave to God and became millionaires all of a sudden. So they, that's the extremes we find. But what I want to show you is that God takes care of both. We're going to look into in the, here probably next week how certain governments now, the first thing they do is they go and kill the rich. They literally go and murder the rich. That's the idea. It's happened in history quite a bit. But what they found when you murder the rich, then no one knows how to run the, pro, run the things. No one knows how to manage. No one knows how to, to do specific high-level tasks. And the whole people just go Phew. So. You gotta have, God kind of knew that we had to have both. The key is, though, that God says the, the difference is, is that you, the, he made it so the rich could not overtake the poor and rule over them. And we're going to go into that a little bit more, just a teeny bit more today. Today, what we're going to go over 
is we're going to talk about the sacrifice, why the sacrifices were important. We're going to talk about the sheeps and the goats. We're going to talk about scapegoats. We're going to talk about the blood. We're going to talk about that stuff and why all of it was very important. So let's get going. So what to do to atone for our sins. Now, keep that word in mind, atone, because that's going to be important here in just a few minutes. But when a member of the community sins unintentionally, and does what is forbidden in the Lord's commands, when they realize their guilt, the sin they have committed comes known, they must bring an offering for the sin they committed of a female goat without defect. So we're going to see that they're going to need, there's either going to be a sheep or there's going to be a goat. And, you're, we're get, we'll, and we'll get to why that's important here in just a little bit. So when God talked about sins, they also dealt with the poor. If you are a high priest or a leader of the congregation, you are to bring a young bull. Male goat for the leader, female goat or lamb for common persons. Male goats were worth a lot more than female goats. Dove or pigeons for the poor, and if you are very poor, then a little bit of the finest flour. The idea is God says you have to pay for, the sins have to be paid for, and when it hits our pocketbooks, it tends to hurt a little bit. It's like, ooh, what that Maybe sin is really, really important. What about intentional sins? Intentional sins, the Lord said to Moses, if anyone sins and is unfaithful to the Lord by deceiving a neighbor about something entrusted or theft to him about something stolen, if they cheat their neighbor, if they find lost property or lie about it, if they swear falsely, a sin against people they may commit, when they sin in any of these ways they must, and they realize their guilt, they must return what they've stolen, taken by extortion, or what is entrusted to them, or the lost proper they found. Goes on just a little bit more. Whatever it was they swore falsely about, they must make restitution, pay back, and add a fifth of the value to it. Now guys, that's no different than our court system today. Our court system today is just like that. That's why they fine you. They fine you in the court systems because what it does is that it's a punishment to say, hey, wait a minute, I have to pay this back, and i got to pay a fine on top of it. Ooh, that's not worth it. Because again, it hits the pocketbook. Same way of our court system. And that's what God wanted them to do. And as a penalty, they may bring the priest, that is, to the Lord, their guilt offering a ram from the flock. Now, so this is where it gets important. Remember, before, unintentional was a goat. Intentional is a male sheep. Okay, we'll get to that in just a minute, why that's important without defect and of proper value. It's got to be the best. God doesn't want second best, maybe something blind. And even now, even I will say this, that God, even the priests could not be blind or lame. God wanted everybody, whatever stands before him, to be good examples. Now, not that God hated the poor, because if we, we read last week, that he took care of the poor, he took care of the blind, he took care of the lame, he took care of all of that. But God wanted before him only the best. And they will be forgiven for things they did that made them guilty. What do we do next? After that, they are to lay their hand on the head of the sin offering, transferring the sins, their sins, to the animal. So what they're going to do is they're going to lay their hand on it and say, you know, my sins are going on this animal. What I did, the animal's taken, going to take the punishment for it. And slaughter the, in place the burnt offering. Now, this, there was not always only burnt offerings. We'll talk about burnt offerings here in a few minutes, but get the picture. Then the priest is to take some of the blood with the finger and put it on the horns of the altar. So the blood needs to be on the altar. So what they do is, and I know this is kind of graphic, they put their hand on, they pray for it, and they slice the throat. The blood will drain, and they take some of the blood and put it on the altar. So, life for life. You deserve to die because of our, we deserve to die because of our sins. God said, you're going to take that animal, the best, the most expensive one. Now think about this. What if God would say to you, when you sinned, you, inten intentional sin, you say, well, I want you to take the highest price electronic device that you have, device you have, and take it and sacrifice it. 
ouch. The most important thing to you, your phone or your computer or the most highest price electronic device. So every time you sin, you're, so we end up with no electronic devices anymore. That's one way to get rid of them. But think about it. it. That's what it was like to them. The highest price thing is sacrificed for them. Perfect versus defective. A perfect specimen cannot be substituted for a defective one in God's eyes. Moreover, a perfect animal is worth much more than a defective one. We just talked about that. God wanted them to understand the true cost of sin. The perfect specimen must, must be there. Why a lamb instead of a goat? Well, we, it's interesting. Now, this is kind of difficult. And I, so I'm going to try to explain to you guys. Because as I went through this and read all about goats, I read all about sheep, I did some study back and forth, I, I kind of had a hard time kind of figuring out. Because sometimes they want a goat, sometimes they want a sheep. But I, what it really was, was that sh the thing about sheep and that's why when we see in the parable of the sheep and the goats, why God said the sheep are the good and the goats are bad. Because the sheep were docile. They followed the leader. They did what the, leader, the, the shepherd wanted them to do. They were easy to take care of. They, had, they were very open to what the leader, they'd be very scared and they couldn't make it. They truly couldn't make it without the leader. Okay? So the sheep, that's why the sheep were like sheep. And that's why he says sheep are the ones, the more important ones. Like in Genesis, God said to provide the lamb for the burnt offering for my son. And the two of them went together. So they were about ready to, to, um, to sacrifice Isaac. Then Moses summoned the elders and said, go at once to select animals for your family for slaughter of the Passover lamb. Now, I'm sorry, but I think that is like the cutest picture I've ever seen in my entire life. That is like going, oh my gosh, you know, like, oh wow, that's cute. So they look so happy together. But that's why God wanted, wanted sheep. But also the thing is about sheep, he says, we all like sheep of went astray. One of the things about sheep, and those sheep get scared, they take off. They all, we all went astray. They kind of went our own way. In the Bible, lambs see as docile follows what we just talked about. They need a shepherd, they easily go astray. They are easily to take care of, whereas goats do their own thing. They're a little more stubborn. They're not easily led. Sheep can, can be seen as the more innocent of the two, which is true. We can, I mean, is that not innocent or what? I'm telling you. So sacrificing an innocent is much harder than one deserves it. The goat, you know, you ever see goats, and you got to, like, you know, pull them along and everything else. The sheep is innocent. They're going to follow you, do what you want. And you, so now this innocent sheep must die for the people. But it sounds like someone else we know. Why do you think they call the Lamb of God? When John said, the next day, John was there with his disciples and said, when she saw Jesus passing by, look, the Lamb of God. Do you think that the, the, his disciples knew exactly what he was talking about? Absolutely. We've got to remember, the people back then, these guys were all Jewish. They knew exactly what John was talking about. Because they knew what, what the sheep and the goats and everything, because they lived it on a daily basis. With, so Jesus was, that's why Jesus is the Lamb of God. And we see in Revelation about this. And when he had taken the four living creatures, 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one with a harp holding golden bows full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open up its seals because you were slain. Yes, sir. John, it's interesting you say that. And we know this, but we take it for granted. Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. He made it very clear that he, he is the Son of God and that he talks specifically with God. He made it very clear mm -hmm. that, that that's who he is and what he is. Absolutely. There is no question. So it's interesting you say that because the Muslims say, well, Jesus is just a prophet. 
Well, Jesus can't be a prophet because he made it very clear who he was. If he was a prophet, he would have been killed because the thing is, or they could have just got rid of him. Because prophets, you can't say, I come from God. You can't just say, I am God. Jesus was very specific. So that, again, in itself, you know, I, and I like to, I like to uh, reference Islam because Islam is probably the biggest religion in the world. And bil a billion people follow it. But it can't be true. Because if they're saying Jesus is just a prophet, as Muhammad said, that's impossible because he wasn't. Because he was a liar then if he was just a prophet. Because he, he said he's God. So, but he's, he's not just a prophet. He is God. Thank you, Wayne. I appreciate that. And with your blood, you purchase for God the persons from every tribe. Remember, they sliced the neck and the blood dripped. By his blood, they purchased. You made them a kingdom of priests to serve, you, serve our God, and they will reign on earth. So in Revelations, it talks about, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the world, sin of the world. So let's talk about how the Jews used to do this on Yom Kippur. Now, they used to make sacrifices every day, but once a year they had a thing called the Day of Atonement. They call it Yom Kippur. It's actually in September. So Leviticus 16 says, symbolize atonement for the sins of the Israelite nation, which was the day when the entire house of Israel fasted and rested. So Yom Kippur was a day set aside. Multiple animals were sacrificed during this time of the high priest, the priests, and the people. They would blow a shofar. And, if you, and I actually got a chance to go to a, uh, a Jewish Christian church one time where they blowed the shofar, and that was really cool. I was like, wow, that's what, that thing really does work. The, this holiday is similar to Lent. If, those, if you, any of you know about Lent, Lent, Lent is longer. I think Lent, Lent starts, I believe, in February. It goes for about almost two months. But they spend 10 days of fasting and repentance for the Day of Atonement, where the animal is sacrificed, and here we get to the scapegoat. There is a scapegoat. Okay, let's talk about the scapegoat for a minute. After the death of an animal, the scapegoat will be released. He is to lay both hands on the head of a live goat, confess over the wickedness and rebellion of the wicked. So basically, this goat, they're going to lay the hands on, transferring the sins. This only is on the Day of Atonement only, once a year. All their sins, he puts on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness. Okay, remember. Now, I thought about this. Wait a minute. They would have to use a goat. Would a sheep do very well by themselves out there? No, they wouldn't. No, that's why, you had, that's why they used a goat. Because a goat is more stubborn. They will do the thing. But a, per, a person actually, takes them, take, actually leads them out there. Into the world of care for, and in the care of someone appointed to the task. Basically, they lead him out there and they let the goat go. The goat will carry on by itself all the sins of the people to a remote place, and the man shall release it to the wilderness. And why is that important? Because of this. As far as the east is from the west, so far he's removed our transgressions from us. That's where this, this verse becomes alive. Now do you understand why the Old Testament is so important? Do you, you can understand what this actually means. When he says, as far as the east is from the west, I know you've probably read this. Everybody's read one, Psalm 103. We've read it. What that means is the goat will go far into the wilderness and the sins go far away from the people. It is a demonstration to show that. And Isaiah, though, this becomes even more to us because of this. Surely he took up our pain. He bore our suffering, the, our sins. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, each to our own way, but the Lord has, what? Laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's why Jesus is the scapegoat. So we know what, we probably know what, many of you know what a scapegoat is. A scapegoat, we usually say someone who takes the fall for somebody. 
So you're, oh yeah, I'm going to be the scapegoat. Basically, you're going to take the fall for everybody. So this, Jesus was the scapegoat. Jesus was the Lamb of God. All of this stuff points to Jesus. And this is why the Old Testament is important for us to go into. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he is the atoning, day of atonement. He is once and for all the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. We no longer need a day of atonement anymore. It's done. Once and for all. So everything they would do every single year, Jesus did once and for all because God himself came down and bore all that. Let's talk about the blood. Now, this is kind of dear to my heart. I teach anatomy and physiology. I teach about the human body. So I kind of get into this kind of stuff. But why is blood important? Well, let me tell you a little bit inside blood, what's inside blood. Okay, there are five main types of white blood cells in blood. There's a lot. And actually, there's more than, there's five main types, but there's a lot more white blood cells than that. There are red blood cells, which carry oxygen. Platelets, which clot your blood. Large proteins or proteins like HDL and LDL, which carry cholesterol and, and fat. So, um, ions like sodium, potassium, magnesium. Now, if you're wondering why the pluses and minuses are there, I put those because once it goes in, and I know this is just, I just threw this in just kind of fun, but the pluses and minuses because they disassociate. So sodium chloride, which is table salt, actually becomes sodium and chloride, like that. That's why I had to put it in there. All that stuff, vitamins, fat, glucose, antibodies to fight infection, fibrinogen to clot your blood. You get the point. A lot of stuff. Carries life-giving nutrients to the cells, transports away stuff. It is truly life. Blood is truly life. Now, that's physiological. They didn't know that back then. We do. But I'm just telling you, it's physiological. Blood truly is life. Without blood, we wouldn't be able to do anything. That's a purple blood smear. I used to look at those all the time when I was in the lab, lab tech. But in old times, people equated blood and death together. The ba this battle here, I'm sorry, I forgot to take the E off there because I hate the BCE because we're before Christ and after Christ. That's what our lit years are set forth. I don't like that. But the thing is, people are dying. And sorry for the next slide, it's ra this is rated R but I wanted you guys to get the point. When men bleed, their life slowly drains away from them. So as, the, as God, they're talking about this, the thing is, when people see other people bleeding, they slowly die. We've watched it on TV and stuff like that. We may have even seen it on the battlefield. People die, their life slowly drains away. So blood has a lot to do with life. God sees blood as life. Leviticus 17, the life of every creature is in its blood. That's why I've said you must not eat the blood of the creature. Because the life of every creature is in its blood. Anyone who eats it must be cut off. This is very important to understand. God takes blood very seriously. But we know why. Because when, when blood is released, when they killed the animal, blood is what covers the sins. You must not eat meat that has lifeblood in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand for accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and every human being, too. I will demand accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. That's, that's interesting. And for, the, and for the image of God, for God has made mankind. Blood is very important. That's why when Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, he bled, and the blood is life. His blood covered us, and that's why they put it on the altar. So blood is extremely important to God. That's the reason why we always talk about the blood of Jesus, because the blood of Jesus is life. It is life, and we've just seen that physiologically, and we, we've seen it from a historical standpoint. Any questions? Okay. 
So the Bible talks about blood oh, 369 times. That's from the King, King James Version, but it's pretty much in the 300s with most versions. Blood is talked about a lot in the Bible because blood is very important. What they would actually do in the sacrifices, once they kill the animal, before they, sac before they put them on the altar, they would actually make sure the animal's blood was drained away. They would wash it all out and everything just to make sure of that. And so... How many must die for our sins? The priest would have to sacrifice twice a day. They have to do two sacrifices a day. And the people would have to give their best, their best flocks from blessed of their flocks for their sin. Think of how many sacrifices had to be made so the people would be right from God. How many sacrifices when you sin, how many animals would it take to get you right with God? That's a lot. A lot, and it was a continual thing because we don't stop sinning. Can you see the problem here? You can see the need for Jesus to die as the ultimate sacrifice. It's true. He, that's why God himself had to come down and die for us. Because the reality is, is that animals can't do it. We, won't ha we don't have enough animals to kill for all of us. I mean, think of all the animals we would have to bring. Or whatever else, if, you, if you're poor, you would actually bring pigeons. But still, it's still, you have to continue to give life for life. I always like what Chuck Missler said. He said that, you know, whenever we eat food, even then, plants and animals are giving life for us. So someone always gives life for the other. And in this, we see that someone had to die because what we say, yes, ma'am. No, Israel is not doing it now. And it's interesting you say that because the thing about it, it, the Israel, uh, what we know that when the church was destroyed in 70 AD, that's when the sacrifices stopped. Because you're only supposed to do the sacrifices in the temple. We'll get to that later on, but that's a great question. Yeah, they're not doing it. So I don't know, I don't know how they're able to take care of things. I, I don't know. I, I always think about that. How do you take care of things if they're not doing sacrifices, the, the Jews? I don't know. But that's a good question. Uh-oh. There we go. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Ultimately, God's like, you know, someone dies for you, but ultimately, it really, it's us supposed to die, Sac but, and God said, sacrifices and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. But then I said, here I am. It is written about me. I have come to do your will, my God. Who is he talking, what are they talking about? Who are they talking about? Jesus. God is not interested in blood and goats. God gave the one sacrifice. Now do, you, now do you understand why it's so important to understand about Jesus and understand why the Old Testament talks about this stuff so much? It goes into so much detail of this because the reality is, is it was very important and it sets up the reason why Jesus came. So all the things we've learned about Jesus, his blood, his resurrection, his, his, um, you know, his atonement, all these things we just talked about, and we found them all where? The Old Testament. Interesting. What, and so you ever ask yourself, what, are they, what actually do they do with those sacrifices after they kill the animals? Ah, there's actually two things they do. Well, this is one of them. So the priests prepare the sacrifice, are often usually eaten. If it's just a normal sacrifice, the priests actually ate those. Because we've got to remember that the Levites were not given a portion of land. Okay? When in Joshua they were allotted things out, the, pre, the Levites did not get a portion of the land. The Levites got everything. Every, their whole job was to deal with the temple and the temple aspects, the teaching, everything else. That's what they were there for. Fat is ne did you know fat is never consumed in this? They actually have to cut all the fat out. It's part, of, it's part of the process. They have to cut it out, which is actually a smart thing, but we'll get to that. We'll talk more about that later. 
They actually also have to wash the entrails. They have to actually, uh, fat, but fat is always to be burned. They have to burn the fat. Even though gonna, the priests are going to eat the sacrifice. Now, there are some times in which when you give, when you give a free will offering to God, saying, I love God, God just bless me, I want to, get, I want to offer this, to him, this animal to him as a free will offering, the people actually were allowed to eat that, pork, that, but they had to eat it at the temple. So there, there was different times they do that. So burnt offerings. Now, sometimes God says, burn it up. You cut off the head, you skin it, take out the fat and cut it to pieces. The priests were to keep the skin and burn the rest. Only burning away that which is inside can bring us new. So when God destroys that which is inside of us to bring about new life, this signifies a complete dedication and consecration to God when it's, it's called the whole burnt offering. Now, I always think about this. Um, I come from Colorado, and I remember when Yellowstone had, a, and I've been to Yellowstone. If you've ever been there, it's beautiful. But they had a big fire. But then I saw this show one time that 10 years afterwards, they showed what the, what the fire produced. A beautiful, beautiful, lush countryside. Only the fire takes it and cleans it up, and we get a beautiful countryside. But I also thought about something else. I thought about Aslan. If you ever read the, the Chronicles of Narnia, this reminded me, reminded me of the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, when, I was, when I was first out of the military, I was in college, and I, my college professor told me, if you want to learn how to speak better, read better, write better, read C.S. Lewis. I took her seriously, and I read all the C.S. Lewis, and I, I read a lot of C.S. Lewis. But in this story, in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, this guy named Eustace became a dragon. He was a, terrible, he was a terrible kid. He became a dragon. And in the story, Aslan, which is Jesus, basically said, I have to peel all your skin off of you to make you brand new. The idea is is that God has to change us from the inside out. He has to take care of us. And that's where I, always, I thought about this story, and I thought about what we just talked about, is burnt offering, that God has to change us inside. It's not what we see here that's bad. Here is not bad. What's bad is in here. And that's why we have to, God has to burn it up and get rid of it. And even at that, peel our skin off and change the inside. All right, we got a little bit more time. We have miscellaneous laws. So we're going to go into some kind of fun stuff here that I hope you guys are going to get some information out of it. So the next section of, this, of the law, I want you guys to understand that it was written 3,400 years ago. That's 3,400 years ago. This is important. So keep in mind that 3,400 years when we talk about this. So one of the thing is, is in healthcare, the law. The law was very good with healthcare, okay? And I'll tell you that it was not just good, it was awesome. And from a, health, from a person myself who's been in healthcare all my life, who teaches the human body, what God said 3,400 years ago was pretty phenomenal. Sadly, we didn't take it, we didn't use it. And it took us a long time to get to this point. But I will tell you that it's very important. Now, I threw some, 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 some facts up here, just kind of have fun. Um, so, Bordetella pertussis, a measles virus. But prior to the 1960s, millions of children were infected worldwide. So, now we have, now we have um, vaccin vaccinations. How long ago? So, I'm going to ask you guys a question. I want you to think, don't, don't tell me. I'm going to ask you three questions of how long ago this happened. How long ago did we actually discover this? And this is important, because remember, we just talked about, God talked about it 3,400 years ago. But how long did it take us to figure out what God already was teaching them? So how long ago did we discover bacteria? Okay. So that's Staph aureus, where they get, where they get MRSA. You guys have probably ever heard of MRSA. That's what that stuff is. That's methyl resistant Staph aureus. Next question. When did we discover that bacteria causes disease? How long ago did that happen? By the way, prior to 1950, Vibrio cholera, 50% of the troops were killed because of cholera, because of tainted water. 
And that's important because we're going to find out that God already took care of that issue. He told them how to deal with their sanitation issues 3,400 years ago so that 50% of your troops are not going to die from tainted water. Okay? One of the problems with, with even today, even today, people are pooping and peeing and playing in, in their water supply. And we wonder, and that's why so many of the people are dying, because tainted water. God takes care of that, though. When did doctors first begin to wash their hands when taking care of multiple patients? Okay, that's important, because in God, he taught them to always wash. God will talk, we'll talk about how God wants them not only to wash their hands, to wash their clothes, to wash, the, and how God specifically told them this. Okay, and the law talked about all that. Bacteria was discovered by Lewin Hook 1700, in the 1700s, 300 years ago. 300 years ago. 3,400 years ago, God was talking about how to deal with this stuff and how to take care of this stuff. We figured it out, just bacteria, then. Okay? Disease was discovered. What actually causes disease? By Koch in 1882. Hmm. A little over 100 years ago. It wasn't that much long. And Semmelweis published a paper in 1840 about how to wash their hands between patients. Doc and doctors didn't take him serious. 25% of the women that were being delivered, delivering babies, would die right after they delivered because of infection. But in the Bible, we'll, we'll find out that the law says how the women are supposed to be separated, isolated, that, they're, that they have to the priests always have to wash their hands, and everything has to be clean going in. God told us what to do in the law circa 1450 BC, 3,400 years ago. If we would have paid attention to what God told us, he would have taken care of everything. That's amazing. Now this, I mean, this to me is, I love this kind of stuff because I'm really into, health, I'm really into the human body. So, but the thing, now, so how do you describe infection to someone who would not understand it for 3,300 years? 3,300 years later, it took us to, be, to understand infection. How do you describe, how did God describe, tell the people? And this is important because this will help you to understand why God kept saying unclean, 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 unclean. When you read the Pentateuch, like you, you are unclean. You are unclean before this. You are unclean before this. You are unclean, unclean. But the thing is, you tell them that it's uncleanliness. They don't know that it's bacteria. They don't know that it's a virus. They don't know anything, but they know it's unclean. So when God describes that way, He's protecting them. Next, you tell them what to, to do if they become unclean. Destroy your pottery, he talks about in Leviticus. If the pottery gets tainted, anything inside of it, you've got to destroy it. That's an infection control issue. This is like first-year medicine, infection control stuff. Wash their clothes. If the clothes have mildew, they're to burn them. That's infection control. Do you think anybody ever burned them in the Middle Ages? No. They're to bathe. They're to clean their houses. Houses could be infested with toxic mold or whatever. And they, and they said, so this is what you're going to do. You're going to clean the house out. 3,400 years ago. Remember, we didn't know what, didn't, no one washed their hands. We didn't know what that disease we just thought it was just a curse from God, and we didn't, know, we didn't know some of this stuff. The key is, is that God told them this stuff. Yes, ma'am? Well, the question would be water. Wouldn't a lot of them, they were desert people? Mm -hmm. So if they were at all being sinful, they would have been in the water. Water. Because remember, they're, number one, they had the Jordan River running right through them. They had the, they had the, Jordan, the Jordan River running right through them. Also, they had wells and they weren't that far from the coast. So they have rainfall, and some of the areas, depending on what they are, some of the areas got up to 20-some inches of rain a year. 
So they would gather them, and they would have cisterns. They would have these big, these big vats underneath their by their houses, and they would gather the water. So the key is, is that if any, if like a dead body or something gets in there, it's infection control. God had said, you've got to get rid of it. So God was protecting him. Now, it's interesting you ask that because one of the things, and we're going we're gonna to end right here, one of the things that we see that God does in all this is when you get into Deuteronomy, God says, today I'm presenting with you life and death. Choose life, he says. Over and over again, he says, if you follow my ways, you will have life. Yes, you will have life, literally. It's not just about the religion. It's about that God told them specific ways to take care of themselves, wash themselves, keep themselves clean, how to get, how to, he, he had isolation, the isolated people. He talked about how, when you urinate or defecate, to go down a hill, put it in a, in a pile, and then cover it up. When I was in Japan, in Okinawa, they had what called benjo ditches. People would just urinate in the ditches. They would poop in the ditches. They would do whatever. They just let it run. I mean, it's just like, but God said, don't do this. So when God was telling them, I will give you life. If you do what I tell you, I give you life. That's another thing what he was talking about. That is amazing. Our God is amazing. And we'll go more into this next week. Any questions? All right, hope you guys got some good information from it. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys next week.